Good evening, gentlemen and ladies. I'm going to talk to you tonight about how I oil paint my leaves for my carvings. The first piece I did, I had spent many hours hand sanding each one of these leaves so they were just as smooth as the shell on the gourd. And I know from carving on a gourd that the meat is much softer and more porous than the shell. And it will take liquids entirely differently. It just sucks them all in. What I find is that if it's anything with a water base, it raises the grain on it. Just like any wood, if it's hit with a lot of water, it's going to raise the grain on it. I didn't want to do that because I'd already spent all the months sanding this all down by hand. So I talked to the guys and I said, tell me what I should do. And I said, spray it with oil, paint it with oil, and then seal it with oil. And you'll never have to worry about raising the grain on it. So I took their advice. I got my 40% off coupon from Michael's or Hobby Lobby. And I went down and I bought a 24 pack of little tiny oil paints, just one set. That's all I needed. And I've been using it for years. Because as you can see, it doesn't take a lot of paint when you're working with this stuff. And I love the oils because when I use them, I use them extremely thinly. So they dry overnight because they're so thin. But a lot of times, if you put a heavier coat on, it's going to take a little longer to dry. Um, usually what I do is this has already been sprayed, sanded and sprayed. As you can see, I've started painting some of the leaves on it. And this one, of course, is finished. But if we take a look, close look at the leaves, you can see on this one, the leaves, those leaves veins were all done in a brownish black. They're all the same color. It's not as interesting or as good looking, I think, as this one, where the leaves I've taken the darkest color in each leaf and then put the veining in, then added the highlights on each one to make them look like they're more part of the leaf rather than just static on here. So I'm going to show you how I do my technique. Um, I have really fine brushes, um, shorts, but they're all round. I don't particularly care for too many flat brushes. Um, I work primarily by just kind of punching in the colors. I always start out with my lightest one. I always wet the bristles first. I learned it in acrylics. You do the same thing with the oils. Only with this, I don't I have a tendency to wipe as much off because I want it to thin it out. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how I load a brush. I'm going to grab a little of the paint thinner in here. I'm going to pull a little bit, a tiny bit out, and I'm going to thin it down. And I'm going to sweep it back and forth. And as long as there's just a hair of paint left on here, the brush is now loaded. By sweeping it back and forth, you're going to pull the paint up into the bristles. Now we've got a fair amount of paint in there. So we can start out here on one of these. I'm going to say, because this one has some darker areas in it already, and I'm going to see part of that through there, we're going to go ahead and use that as part of our guide as to where we're going to paint. I don't bother to clean the brush too much between each one because what you're going to find is that there's not much paint left on it by the time I get it done with it because it's so thin. We're working our darkest neck. I just work up gradually, starting with the lightest, working up into the darker colors. Now I have collected many leaves off the yard. Um, I usually try to find them when they're in their peak of color, even if I have to get a ladder out and very shakily climb up and grab one off a tree. I usually laminate them and then I put them in the freezer. It keeps the color a little longer on them so that they're usable. Um, if you don't laminate them, it, they are not airtight. They'll turn brown eventually, even if you're in a freezer. So by laminating, they're sealed in there. You can also put them in um, vacuum seal bags the same way, but the, some of them have texture on them, so you're not going to be able to see it as clearly as if it was laminated through clear plastic. I try not to use too many of the same colors of the leaves that are around it, so each leaf will stand out just slightly from the others.
when I do my reds, I find that they're very, very intense. So I try to have a tendency to use a little less of the paint with them because they'll go so much further. With the leaves, I think it's the biggest thing is just being able to allow yourself the freedom to use the colors in any combination you want. Because there's always going to be some of these leaves are still going to have green on them, even after they're falling on the ground. Sometimes it's just walking around and paying attention to each individual leaf that you see laying on the ground. If it's a different shape, different size, different color, or it's the color that caught your eye because there's this brilliant yellow leaf laying amongst all these plain brown ones. It's just noticing what's going on with the leaves, how they show their age and deteriorate as they fall off the trees. I think the nicest part of working with oils is that when I start working on these, it could take me days to paint all the leaves on a single piece because I'm basically just taking my time, working on one leaf at a time. There's no point in rushing through this and getting a bunch of them all patterned out only to find out that it's all going to blend in and it's all going to look the same. So I try to pick out, do one in yellows and ones in sets of green, maybe one in just in the browns. But I'm thinking which ones are on top should be the brightest colors because they're the ones that have newly fallen. So consequently, I'm always thinking about which ones I'm going to keep the darkest colors on. We get up here, and these are all undercut, so we want to accentuate those areas by going underneath the undercuts with a darker color just to highlight those areas. And that's the beauty of using these really fine little haired brushes is you can just slide them right up underneath where you need them. And the oil thins down fairly well to be able to get where you're right where you need it to go. Then I'm going to blend those out just a bit. And then I use my finger. Because that seems to be the best, best blending tool I have. Just to model this up just a bit. It's going to give it a little bit more of a blended appearance to it. And I'm going to take what they call um, a long brush, a long bristle brush for lining. The longer bristles give you um, more paint in it. But if you roll it on its side, it goes to a really, really fine point. And because the brush is loaded now with paint, you can make an, a a very long thin line and it will go the entire length of the paint that's in the brush. I usually start at the top of the leaf, pull it straight down. You want to reload after every single brush stroke so you're always starting out with a full load of brush, full load of paint in your brush. Try not to make the lines too straight. You want a little bit of play with it. I have a tendency to find that I pull towards me easier when I'm painting, so I'll just roll the gourd rather than try to go in the opposite direction and mess it up. And once I get all these in, Now I use primarily red sable brushes. I like the very soft bristles. They are delicate and they uh, don't take much abuse, but they are really nice to use for painting because they're very soft and they won't uh, show too many of the brush marks when you're working even with acrylics.
All right, now we've got the br main bristles on, or br br banes in. We're going to clean this out just a bit. I'm going to take some white now, and I'm going to blend it with my lightest yellow so we can create the highlight on the leaf. It's easier to make a little extra paint now than try to match it up later. So I always make a little more than I think I'm going to need for a single leaf. Because you'll never be able to match it up once you do just enough. So let's see, we've got them all coming from this side. So now I'm going to go in here and I'm going to add the highlights. By running this just right up to the edge of the first ones we've done. These little highlights were blended in as well so they're not quite as pronounced as you see them here. But we want to keep our light source all coming from the same direction so where you start you've got to make sure that everything matches as it goes around the piece. I find too that once this paint is actually dried on the gourd that I can take the thinner and go back in even after it's slightly dried and still work with it and reliquify the paint because it is very thinly placed on here. Okay now we've got this on here. We've got the highlights done on it but they're very bold and it's a very shocking color. So what I'm going to do is again take my finger and just pat down just a little bit to knock down some of that brightness on there and leave it just a little bit muddied. So it dulls it down just a bit. Then I'm going to come back in with a shorter brush again using our darkest color and we come back in here we're going to put some spots on it. These are what we call sugar spots as they grow older the leaves will get these sugar spots in them. You can do them in brown. I usually try to match them up with the leaf that I'm working on. How many you put on is up to you. But it just gives the leaf a nicer look to it and more realistic. Now sometimes if we're dealing with wood um, and I have it sealed well, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and take a little bit of um, paint thinner on my brush and just wet down the piece that I'm going to start on. That gives you a little bit more work time on the, with the oil on your surface. It gives you a little more work time. Paint thinner? Yeah, turpinol, paint thinner, any of those liquefying products will work on here. And because we're working with primarily this meat of this gourd, it does change a little bit of the color on the leaf that you're painting because of the fact that the gourd is in pure white. It's just going to change the look of it as we work on it. The folks asked me if I paint if I painted all these leaves. I said no. I just really kind of just punch the color on. I I don't consider myself a painter at all. 
I play with it, but that's about it. That's about the extent of it. And I think that's how we get good at anything. We just keep playing with it if we like it. I started with Gourds about 18 years ago, and I've been with the club since 05. So I've been not carving quite as long as I've been with Gourds. But I love to carve. It's just one of those things that I can't get enough of. That's why I'm building a dust collector to go into my house. Because <laughs> I can't stand being freezing out in the, out in the garage in the winter times. <laughs> so Mama wants to be warm. And again, we're going to take some of the darker color and just run it right up underneath there. It gives you a little bit of a green now to it because it's picked up some of the color from the gourd itself and it's just trying to change it just a slight color so it gives you that little bit of life left in the leaf just before it's going to die. So with this one we could go with a darker vein uh, just to highlight it a little bit more. I have a template. Okay. Um, I cut it out of uh, plastic. I originally started out making them out of uh, poster board and then out of cardstock. But after continuous use, the edges break down and you don't get the nice sharp points on the leaves. So once I cut them out of plastic, they're permanent. And I have, um, you can buy acetate, which is a very thin sheeted plastic, and they have the uh, some of the ladies who do scrapbooking have a machine called crickets or uh, circuit cutters and you can set a pattern into it and it will tell, the computer will tell it and you can like adjust the size that you want. So I have leaves that you can do. There's a one little cartridge does four different types of little leaves on it and you can stretch it out or blow it up to whatever size you want it to. Um, primarily I just picked up leaves out of the garden and, and you brought them in the house and yeah, exacto blade. Scalpel works too. Yeah, just usually cut them out, but I will draw them on. Um, workable acetate uh, allows you to draw on it, so you can use a permanent marker or an etching pencil or a pen, even just to draw on it to get the first line around it. And then, because you can draw on it, you can put the veins in if you want. Um, acetate is really fun. To, it's a real nice plastic to work with, and it's real flexible, so it works well on a gourd. And I have, I don't know, 20, 30 different leaves. I've got a little plastic box filled with them, and they come from little tiny ones all the way up to great big ones. So it just depends on what size I need for the project I'm working on. All right, I'll invade one more time. I think the blendability and the colors that you can get out of oils, the fact that you don't waste as much paint because you're using it and it doesn't dry out when, you're, when you set the palette down, regardless of whether they're just these tiny small blobs of paint on here. Tomorrow morning I can get up and go back in, soak my brush down and start working with it again. It's still there. You can basically use up the entire product. So I don't get it why these people buy these great big tubs of oil paint when you know these little bitty ones is all I ever need because I don't use a lot of paint when I'm painting on a piece because I use it so thinly. But I suppose if you're using this as an artist and you're painting with it on a daily basis you probably need more of it. I had not used oil colors. Pardon?
that's personal choice. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't uh, have any rhyme or reason to it, whatever strikes my fancy. Um, this one, because it was surrounded by things that were orange, I want to do something more uh, in the yellow and green. This one might be in a burgundy, in a dark red and brown. It might be all browns. I don't, it, whatever strikes my fancy at the time. I kind of look at whatever's sitting around it. Uh, I'll still have to go back in and fill in all the depressed areas with the black and then paint the rest of the bottom of it black like it is on this side. But you can see that it highlights it out and it makes the leaves stand out more from the gourd. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, I sealed it with um, spray oil finish. This is a mat. I happen to have a can of mat at home. Yeah, I, I, because leaves to me aren't really shiny unless they're wet. And this piece shouldn't look like it's soaking wet. So I did them in mat again. Um, they can be shiny when they're alive and they're healthy, but usually they don't have a lot of shine to them when they're on the ground after they've fallen off the tree. Um, I don't use a lot of gloss, um, even semi-gloss. There are certain pieces that it's for, but I, like wood burnings, I prefer to use a mat. Um, I also do all my photographing before I put any kind of gloss or semi-gloss finish on a piece. If it's not matte, um, I, I try to photograph them before I put the final finish on them because that way it doesn't have any glare to it. You're not worrying about the glare for a photograph of it. Particularly if it's going to be something that you need to have for a jury piece. They need to see the piece as well as they can with as high a resolution as they can, as many megapixels as you can give them. Because they want to be able to go in there and look at the details and blow up the picture and really see your piece of artwork. Yes. Yeah, it's usually the final step I do is the background. Um, just because it's, it's the very back of it. And that can go up underneath all the leaves and make sure that they have all their separation. Uh, I'm getting better at it. Um, the bowl, these guys take about 40 hours for one of these, yeah. Um, we've done it in three, I've done finished one in three days. So, yeah, about 24 hours sometimes I can get them done. If I'm just doing the whole thing from start to finish, like we did in the seminar, we could pretty much get it done. But not all the oil painting usually, because that's what takes the time a little bit longer. And the hand sanding, depends on how picky you are. Because some students can get it done in, in five days, and they'll get the whole thing done, get it painted and everything else. But they don't sand it down, they'll sand it, but they spend more time back at their, at their rooms sanding it than we did get time in class to do. But I'm pretty much a perfectionist when it comes to sanding because I have refinished a lot of furniture in my youth. And my bosses always walked on and goes, it has to feel like glass. Otherwise it wasn't done right. So I like the, my pieces to, when they're finished to be as nicely sanded as possible. I even sand the bottoms down here that I'm not even going to carve. Um, I sand all the gourds that I'm going to work on on the outside. Uh, normally I won't even sand the bottom of this, but I know that it's going to be painted and it's going to be touched. And gourds are very tactile and it, to sand it down and make it nice and smooth gives you a really nice finish on the piece. Gourds are kind of rough, so they do need a little bit of TLC. I usually start out about 220, then do a 340 and then a 400. And if I really want to go up to 500 or 1,000 grit, I can. But after 400, it's really, really smooth on here. So it takes a finish really well. I uh, like to sand them when I'm going to do any kind of surface work on them because it makes it easier to work on the gourd. I, yeah, um, I do have a power sander. I've got a little um, three-head disc sander that was made by Sears, um, a rotary sander. It kind of looks like a shaver on the top. The heads all float. But they discontinued it. Um, apparently we were too abusive, us gourd people, and they just kept turning them in, getting them replaced, because people were overdriving them. Um, I bought three of them right when I, the day I found out that they were discontinuing, I ran down to Sears and had to buy three. And now I hoard them because they're mine. <laughs> and I use them to sand the outside of the gourds primarily. Um, I don't use them from the inside because I have other tools for that. But more bigger power tools. Okay, we got that one with the highlights on that. So we can just come in here and just pat down a little bit. 
uh, knock off some of that brightness. Best paintbrush is right here. And that's pretty much how I paint leaves. Uh, we can come back in again with a short stubby brush and put a few little sugar spots in. I, um, when I get the base carving done and all the leaves are shaped, I start at the lowest level and work my way back up. So all of these holes in between the leaves are what I start carving first. Then I come up and do the, uh, the bottom layer. And I literally go through and I'll mark them with a uh, different color marker. This is layer one, this is layer two, this is layer three. Um, once the, the leaves are all defined and undercut to some degree, then I'll go in with a a ball, usually a typhoon or a cuts all, and just hog off divots and waves. Um, I try not to make them all the same so that they're not all f warped in the center or um, eventually I would like to find a gorge like this one is gorgeously thick and if I would known it before I started I'd have done something else with it. Um, particularly because I want to do the curled edge going this way on a gourd, which you don't see. Most, people, most gourds that you're going to see have flat leaves on them. Um, I've introduced this wave. I'm giving them life to the, to the gourd people. Now I want to go actually go the opposite direction and actually curl the leaf out so it's coming actually away from the gourd. So knowing that how thick it is is important to be able to do that um, because we're always dealing with hollow. So you can't get too much of a curl on it and anything that sticks out is very fragile and brittle so it's very hard to deal with. Even the points on these can be, I'll catch, wrap them in towels or something and I'll catch on them. So you very carefully unwrap them. So yeah, they're, they're touchy when you're, when you're dealing with all these really fine points on there. So yeah, wrapping them and taking care of them like that. So anything that's going to stick out. When I carve a gourd and it's done carving, even with this one, I soak them uh, down with wood hardener before I, do the final I start doing the sanding on them. And I'll use a diamond um, to come in and take off the surface uh, coating on the leaves and then hand sand them all down. Because I just, I want to be able to get underneath and all the lines out of it, all the machine marks out of it. Because Regardless of how well you paint, you're still going to be able to see those marks through there, through the paint, particularly as thin as I put it on. So it really needs to be sanded as well as it can possibly be sanded. And to me, it's the difference between first place and best in show. What do you sell one like that for? Um, these boxes, this one goes for $175, which is less than I should be getting for them. But you know what? I don't care. I'd make more. I have lots of gourds. The big one that I did was much more money because that one's 129 hours in it. But the little ones like this, this is going to be an oil candle. There's a hole drilled on the top here and there's a glass vial that sits down in here and has a fiberglass wick on it. And it's completely safe to use on the gourd because the glass contains the wick inside of it and there's a, the top of it is actually a separate piece. So it never gets too hot and it will never burn the gourd. We've tried them, we've burned them for hours, and it just doesn't do anything to the gourd at all. It just, you have to take the top off, and there's a little tiny funnel that comes along with it, and you'd fill it up with oil, and you could put scents in it. Um, they usually last anywhere from two and a half to five hours, depending on how much vial you have to put in the bottom of it for the reservoir. So you could change the scent out on them. The fiberglass wicks we use last three times longer than a cotton wick on it, so you don't have to use as much wick in the thing. Okay, that's our show.